giving birth in the Middle Ages was actually dangerous for women. It was quite common for royal mothers to die during childbirth as there were no medicine or painkillers. These women could only rely on religious superstitions and their midwives. As giving birth wasn't hard enough, royal women also had to follow strict rules and traditions, which didn't make their lives any easier. Keep watching to find out what happened to royal women if they couldn't give birth to a son. In this video, we will discuss the shocking reality of royal women in the Middle Ages. During this time, childbirth was considered a natural process that was part of a woman's life cycle. However, childbirth was also a dangerous event that could result in the death of the mother in a jar or child. In fact, maternal mortality rates were high, and many women died during childbirth due to lack of medical knowledge, poor hygiene, and inadequate health care. Childbirth in the Middle Ages was a family event that involved the entire community. Women typically gave birth at home, surrounded by family members, neighbors, and midwives. Men were not present during childbirth, as it was considered inappropriate for them to be in the birthing room. Instead, they waited outside and prayed for a safe delivery. Midwives played a crucial role in childbirth during the Middle Ages. They were usually older women who had experience in delivering babies. Midwives were highly respected members of the community and were often sought after for their knowledge and expertise. However, their knowledge was limited and they relied heavily on traditional practices and superstitions. The role of midwives in childbirth was to assist the mother in delivering the baby safely. They provided emotional support and physical assistance during the birth process. Midwives also used various techniques to help ease the pain of labor, such as massages, herbal remedies, and warm compresses. However, they did not have access to modern medical tools and equipment, and their methods were not always effective. The birthing room during the Middle Ages was a simple space that was typically located in the family's home. The room was often dimly lit, and a fire was kept burning to provide warmth and light. A bed or straw mattress was provided for the mother to rest on, and a birthing stool or chair was used during delivery. During labor, the mother was encouraged to move around and change positions to help ease the pain and facilitate the delivery the midwife would monitor the progress of the labor and provide guidance on breathing and pushing techniques. If the labor was prolonged or the baby was in distress, the midwife would use forceps or other tools to assist in the delivery. Once the baby was born, it was immediately cleaned and wrapped in warm cloths. The mother was given warm drinks and nourishing food to help her recover from the labor. The placenta was also removed and disposed of as it was believed to be a potential source of infection. After childbirth, women in the Middle Ages were expected to rest and recover for several weeks. During this time, they were cared for by family members and midwives who provided them with food, water, and emotional support. Women were not allowed to engage in any strenuous activities or leave the house until they had fully recovered from the childbirth. While childbirth was a natural process, it was also associated with many superstitions and beliefs during the Middle Ages. For example, it was believed that a pregnant woman should not look at an eclipse or a rainbow, as it could cause harm to the baby. It was also believed that a woman who had a difficult childbirth had been cursed by God or was being punished for some wrongdoing. In addition to superstitions, there were also various medical practices that were used during childbirth in the Middle Ages. One of the most common practices was the use of herbal remedies and medicines to help ease the pain of labor. The life of royal mothers in the Middle Ages was very different from the lives of ordinary women. They were often viewed as political assets and were expected to produce healthy male heirs to secure the succession of the kingdom or dynasty. However, their role in society extended beyond just childbearing and rearing. Royal mothers were expected to be educated and well-spoken, as they often served as advisors to their husbands or sons, who were the rulers. They were also responsible for managing the household, overseeing the education of their children, and managing the kingdom's finances and resources. Royal mothers were often surrounded by a retinue of ladies in waiting and servants who attended to their every need. They also had access to luxury goods and were able to indulge in hobbies and pastimes that were not available to ordinary women. One of the most significant differences between the lives of royal mothers and ordinary women was the level of education and intellectual stimulation that they received. Many royal mothers were educated and could read and write, which was not common among ordinary women during the Middle Ages. They were often well-versed in literature, history, and philosophy, and could engage in intellectual discussions with other members of the court. 
Royal mothers also had significant political influence, and their opinions were often sought after by their husbands or sons. They were expected to use their influence to further the interests of their families and dynasties. They often negotiated alliances with other kingdoms or dynasties through marriage arrangements or treaties. Royal mothers were also vulnerable to political intrigue and were often caught up in power struggles and conflicts between different factions of the court. Royal mothers also faced pressure to produce male heirs, and their inability to do so could have serious consequences for the stability of the kingdom or dynasty. Women who failed to produce male heirs were often blamed for the failure and could face social ostracism or even divorce. The fate of royal women who were divorced in the Middle Ages depended on a variety of factors, including their social status, their husband's political power, and the reason for the divorce. In some cases, royal women who were divorced were sent back to their families' estates and lived out their lives there. They were often stripped of their royal titles and privileges and lived in relative obscurity. However, in other cases, divorced royal women were able to maintain some level of influence and power but only if they had given birth to a son, which was not the case here. Some divorced royal women were able to remarry and start a new life, but most of them chose to enter a convent and live a religious life. You can imagine the pressure that these royal women must have felt to give birth to a son. Nowadays, we know that we don't have any influence on the gender, but in the Middle Ages, they believed that it was the woman's fault if she didn't give birth to a son. If that wasn't enough, Royal mothers were also expected to conform to strict social norms and etiquette. They had to dress and behave in a certain way and were often criticized or ridiculed for deviating from these norms. They were also expected to maintain their chastity and fidelity, and any rumors of infidelity could lead to their downfall. In conclusion, the life of royal mothers in the Middle Ages was very different from the lives of ordinary women. They were privileged and had access to education, luxury goods, and intellectual stimulation. They also had significant political influence and were expected to use their influence to further the interests of their families and dynasties. However, they still faced many challenges and dangers, including the risk of childbirth, political intrigue, and pressure to produce male heirs. Would you want to be a royal woman in the Middle Ages? And what would you do if you couldn't give birth to a son? Let us know in the comments.